Sorry, every time you come, you have you get stuck with me. That's that works. Most of you, I think, probably recognize our assistant district superintendent, Stan Rhodes. Stan has been with us before, and he knows a great deal about us because he's walked through several processes with us. But before that, he was the pastor in Ontario as well. So he's he's a homeboy, kind of. So, and we're always excited to have him with us. And so, Stan, would you please come and minister to us? Thank you so much. It really is great to be here, and uh, it's always a privilege to be with you folks. And I'm always uh, excited about the fact that uh, about that fact because I'm reminded every time I come just how faithful God is. You are just a, a living illustration that God is faithful. Do you realize that? I mean, when I just look at this building, when I look at uh, who you are, and I look at your board members, past and present, and, and I just see how you have sought God's face, and He has honored that, and you have sacrificed, and He has been faithful. I just realized that it's really good to be part of God's people. So I'm, I'm just glad to be here, and, uh, and I'm excited that uh, your pastor is uh, able to be away a little bit, and I hope that this uh, latter part of his away time has been a restful kind of time. And I encourage you to fill up these baskets or whatever else you're going to be doing, and just... Uh, <coughs> Make sure that over the next uh, week or so, he and Sharon have no doubt that they are greatly appreciated and loved and cared for. It'll be great encouragement to them, and I know you will come through in a big way for them. Well, I just have this uh, message that's been burning in my heart for several weeks. It, it just kind of hit me one early um, morning as I was reading in uh, the Gospel of Luke. And I know that's not really our reference this time, but we're going to get to Luke in a moment. And, uh, you know, sometimes when you're just reading God's Word, sometimes He just stops you in your tracks. And even if you plan to go on and read the next chapter, He said, well, I'm not done with that chapter. And He sends you back. I just want to encourage you that when the Lord says He's not done, then don't go where He's not ready to go. Just wait and listen in. Because there's good stuff in there. So I'm excited to share this. The only drawback is that as I thought about this message, I, I said to the Lord, well, Lord, this is really so, this is so simple. Everybody probably already knows it. And, and I'm not sure if it's even long enough to qualify as a sermon. But he reminded me that I preached long enough last time and it could be shorter this time. <laughs> so uh, don't get your hopes up too much, but I'm going to try to do a little bit better on that. I'd like for us to uh, to read in a moment from Luke chapter 7. And I invite you to uh, to find that passage of scripture and leave your Bibles open. But I want to just introduce it a little bit. You know, we are, we are living, as uh, Diane said, we are living in the season of uh, politics. And we are living in the season of big claims, aren't we? Everybody's making claims. And I think everybody intends, at least they say they intend, to follow through on that claim. Well, you know, all of us who call ourselves Christians are making a claim. We're claiming to be Christ followers. That's a big claim. And the world's watching. What do they see? And in First John, the, John says, whoever claims to live in him, and he's in the context, he's talking about Christ Jesus, whoever claims to live in him must, he didn't say, you know, they might think about it, but he says they're really obligated, is what that word literally means, to walk as Jesus walked. And I like the word walk there, it means ought to conduct your life, the word literally means ought to walk around like Jesus walked around. So that wherever you go, in the places you are finding yourselves every single day, whether it's at school or it's at home and at work, all the different places you go, shopping and so on, whoever claims to live in him must walk around like Jesus walked around. That's pretty clear. Or maybe it isn't. I mean, what does that really mean? And so I invite you to take your Bibles to, to Luke chapter 7, and would you please stand in honor of God's Word 
Again, and let's read from uh, chapter 7, and then read on through verses 1 through 15. Two episodes here in Jesus' life, right after he has finished uh, speaking a number of, giving a number of teachings in chapter 6. It says, when Jesus had finished saying all this in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. Now, Capernaum was a was kind of a, a Roman outpost. It was a garrison city. It was uh, one of the key strategic places where the Roman soldiers, uh, where the Romans had, be, had established a presence. And there a centurion servant, a centurion was a Roman commander, whom his master valued highly, was sick and about to die. The centurion heard Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him. This man deserves to have you do this, because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. In fact, if you look at the literal language there, it means he's built our synagogue at his own expense. So Jesus went with them. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Then the men who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. Soon afterward, Jesus went to a town called Nain. That's a short village, a short a village, a short distance away. Not a short village. And his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. As he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a large crowd from the town was with her. And when the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her, and he said, Don't cry. Then he went up and touched the coffin, and those carrying it stood still. He said, Young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. They were all filled with awe and praised God. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for your word, the power of your word. We acknowledge that today your Holy Spirit is here, and you have every intention of speaking into every one of our lives. So we offer you our listening hearts. We offer you our will, our wills to be ready to respond to whatever you speak to us today. And we want to thank you, Jesus, that you are here. We give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. This is really an intriguing couple of episodes. If you read on further in chapter 7, we, we get a picture in the Gospel of Luke where Jesus was really planning to, you know, what, what Luke's point was here. Because right after these two episodes, we find Jesus encountering some disciples from John the Baptist who came to find out, is this Jesus really the one that God sent? Is this the Messiah or not? And one of the demonstrations, one of the uh, proofs, one of the evidences that Jesus pointed to when he sent these disciples of John the Baptist back to John the Baptist, he said, just go back and just report what you're seeing. And if you look further down in verse 22, he says, go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and good news is preached to the it's a pretty astounding series of things that are happening here. 
But Luke doesn't just summarize everything in those few verses. He gives these two episodes, and they are so interesting. And I thought it might be helpful for us so we can understand what might be something that we need to grab hold of today when it, as it has to do with living in Him and, and walking the walk that Jesus walked, you know, walking around in our everyday lives like Jesus walked around in His life. If we might compare these two passages of Scripture, so we're going to go to the next slide. I want you to look at this comparison between the commander and the widow. And the very first thing that we notice is that the commander was a person of note. Let's go to the next slide if you can. Is it not going? Okay. Well, you just listen in really closely. So, so follow this with me. They're, they're the commander was kind of a person of, I mean, he was a big I mean, he was a commander. He was a Maybe Roman soldier. Had, that would get your attention. If you walked down the street and you saw a Roman soldier, you were going to pay a little closer attention, especially that day. The widow, on the other hand, was just, well, she was just a widow. She was just one of many widows. I mean, if there was anybody that was low on the impressive scale, it was a widow in that culture. We, we noticed first uh, another thing about this, uh, this uh, century, and that is that... Uh, the, that, that his servant was still alive. But the widow's son had passed away already. So the past is a little bit different. The episodes are different. We notice that, this, that the commander sought out Jesus. He heard, it said, that Jesus was coming. And so he got his most influential friends around him to say, well, help me out here. And so he sought out Jesus. But in the, in the episode of the widow, verses 11 through 15, Jesus is not even on the, her radar, apparently. There, there's, there's no effort on her part to involve Jesus in this picture. We notice, as I mentioned, that the, the commander had access to influence. He, if there was anybody that you wanted to be able to connect with, a Jewish person, who was becoming famous for the things that he did, a person named Jesus, and you'd want to find the most respected Jews you could find, the most influential Jewish people you could find, to go talk to Jesus in your behalf. And so that's what he did. He accessed these leaders, these Jewish leaders, these elders, it says. And, and, they asked, and he asked them, would you go in my behalf and talk to Jesus? But when you look at this widow lady, she had no access to influence. I mean, there wasn't anybody who was kind of, you know, waving her banner and, and going in place of, of, in her place to find Jesus. There wasn't that at all. If we look in, uh, in verses, verse 4, we find that when these Jewish elders came to Jesus, they said to Jesus, when, and, and they pleaded earnestly with him. I mean, here they are. This is a very interesting situation because, you know, the Jews and the Romans did not always get along. But they found a way to get along because... They, you know, so they, the Jews realized in some ways they needed the Romans to kind of keep things peaceful around there, and, and they knew they wanted to try to get along. And, but but God had somehow begun to work in this centurion's heart, and there was there was a compassion for these Jewish people, which there wasn't always. And so 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 here we have here we have them pleading earnestly in behalf of a Roman soldier. This man deserves to have you do this. He loves our nation. He's built our synagogue. They plead for him. And then we find out that Jesus responded to that plea. I, 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 when you read in the New International Version, it says, so Jesus went with him. It kind of sounds like Jesus was impressed by who this centurion was and what he had done, and so he decided to go with him. But, but I'm not so sure Jesus was impressed by who that person was or what his what his uh, level of authority was, or who was asking him to go, or even what the centurion had done. I think maybe, really, when you look at the whole context of things, Jesus was impressed by the fact that somebody was in a situation where they needed help, and they thought Jesus could do something about it. I'm not so sure Jesus was impressed just by who he was. But we look at the other, the situation of the widow, there's there's, uh, uh, you know, Jesus is not responding to her plea. Jesus is initiating this contact. I mean, she's just, in, she's just wrapped up in her grief. 
And she's walking out of the city, leading the procession with her her uh, funeral, uh, the funeral procession with her son's casket right behind. It was actually a, in, it would not be a casket like we envision in these days, but it was a, a, a funeral, what was called a, a bier. And it was, a, it was a, it's just kind of a thing that was carried on the shoulders of people and, and the body lay in there. And in those days, you know, it was pretty much the, very soon after someone had died, they were, they were placed in the bier and then they would be carried out of town and so on. She, Jesus initiated the contact. She didn't. We find here that apparently the centurion was spiritually responsive. I mean, there's something in his heart that he was he was disposed to to, uh, to be helpful to the Jewish people. There was something there, a willingness to go beyond what he certainly was called to go beyond as a Roman soldier by far. But in the story of the widow, there's no indication of her spiritual receptivity. We just don't know. We just don't know. There's something else interesting about this. You know, in the story of the centurion, Jesus went, and he he uh, he was on his, his way to the centurion's home. And what happened? The centurion sent friends, some more people in his life. Go tell Jesus, don't come any further. You don't really need to come. I'm not worthy to have you come to my home. And so Jesus responds out of that whole encounter, which is an amazing encounter. The man talks about, about uh, you know, why he doesn't need to come. I'm not worthy of it. And you really, you don't even have to be here. He says, just say the word. You've got the authority, Jesus. You don't have to be here. You have enough authority. You just have to say the word, and my servant will be healed. And we know this story. Some of us have read it many times about how amazed Jesus is at his faith. But here's an interesting thing. Jesus healed the servant, but he never saw the servant that we know of. He didn't touch him. He didn't speak to the servant. Now, interestingly, the servant is the one who is alive that he could have spoken to. And maybe be heard. But notice with me the story of the, of the widow. Jesus encounters this widow in this funeral possession, stops her, Tells her to not cry, which is just like the most ridiculous thing to say to someone in that setting. And then in this setting, he does all three of those things. He, he sees the dead son. He touches the coffin. And he speaks to the dead son. Just the opposite. And in the first episode of The Commander, we see that he was a person who understood authority. He exercised authority over other people. He was the commander. Authority was something that he understood. So he could really say, I know what it means, that I can just say the word and something will be done. I don't have to go there to that place. I just say, make sure it's done and it gets done. Lord, I think you're just that same way. You have authority like that. But the widow... Her, her whole experience was that she was a person who, who didn't live. She wasn't one of those authority kind of people. She wasn't in charge of anything. So what was her understanding of faith? Probably not anything like this community. Well, one more comparison. And this just blew my socks off when I saw it. First was this. The commander, Jesus, found in him a, an exemplary faith. He said, I have not found so great a faith in all of Israel. And that's just amazing. It captivates our hearts. I mean, it says something about, wow, you know, that really impressed Jesus, that faith. Faith is a huge factor in that episode. But I want you to notice in the next episode, faith is not even mentioned at all. Isn't that interesting? You know, just for my, just for me, it just kind of looked like that. Isn't it? Yeah. It just got me one day. I've read those stories many times. Like, faith is the big deal. That first thing, faith is not, doesn't even get an honorable mention in the second thing. Okay, so what do these two situations have in common with each other? This is the next slide I'm going to see. And, and I think there are three things. It's, it's so simple. 
But these three things. First is this. All that, I should say, all that could be done had been done. All that the widow could do for her son had been done. We don't really know what the cause of death was. We don't know if it was an accident. We don't know if it was an illness. The second thing we know about both of these situations, and the same is true of the, of the centurion, they had done all they could for that servant, apparently, is that all that had been done wasn't enough. You know, there is really something about the fact that we don't really get around to getting serious with God until we've kind of run out of options. Have you noticed that about yourself? Have you noticed that you lean into God a little bit more when you just find out that you can't lean on your own plan any longer? You know what? I think I have been personally in a season in my life where I have been learning more about walking by faith than in all of my years. Just waiting on God and just, just trusting Him with my life. I mean, I told somebody the other day, I said, you know the hard part about this? Is that I'm actually having to live out all the stuff I've been preaching all these years. I mean, you know, this is, this is getting serious now. This is, this, is a, this is the territory of not just the talking about, this is really living, living in that kind of trust in God. Third thing I want us to know is that both the, the centurion, the commander, and the widow had something else in common. They both were in a predicament that was bigger than they were. It kind of relates to the earlier two things, but it's another way of simply saying that, 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 the, that the centurion, the commander, the guy in charge, the guy who did things done, the guy who had the, the strength of the Roman Empire behind him, couldn't do anything about this. He was stuck. And the widow, who is really one of the most powerless people in society and who was really dependent on her one and only son to give her the life that she needed to provide for her. There was going to be nobody else. She was dependent upon him. This was her future, was her son. And they were, they were when, when she was saying goodbye to her son as they led the way out of that funeral possession, she was also saying goodbye to her future. To her stability, to her economic well-being, to all of that kind of stuff. It was a situation bigger than she was. What was she going to do next? But then I found one other thing that's really the common factor here. Jesus. The common denominator. And that got me thinking about you and about me. Would you look with me in verse 16? When, when Jesus gave back this son who had been dead and now was alive, let me tell you that would be a memorable memorial service to be at, wouldn't it? We're here today, beloved, to pay our last respects to. Oh, never mind. He's alive. <laughs> Here's what it says, verse 16. They were filled with awe and praised God. And then they said this. A great prophet has appeared among us, they said. They didn't quite get that right, but they sort of got it right. But I love this next line. God has come to help his people. When Jesus showed up on the scene, then there's this wonderful news that just breaks loose. God has come to help his people. He's come. That's wonderful news. Where, where hopes have been utterly destroyed and where a future has been ripped from its potential, its possibilities, and, and where maybe, maybe a son or a daughter has wandered away or lost their way or they've been caught in the, in the, the snare of the fowler, as it says in Psalms. God has come. God comes into that situation. God comes into that situation where there's death. God comes into that situation where there's just no more hope. But God comes into the situation where there's nothing else to do. Comes into the situation where all that could be done has been done. And nothing happened. God comes into that situation. And 
then I just began to think a little bit more, and I'm going to invite you to think this through with me. And to connect it back to that opening verse that talks about walking as Jesus walked. I thought about maybe walking as Jesus walked means for me, for you, to live interruptible, others aware lives. Jesus was in Capernaum, he is going somewhere, he is interrupted by this group who pled for him to come to deal with somebody's servant. And then he walks into this village and he sees coming out of the city gates this big and noisy, because it's a very noisy thing when the, when the Jewish people would grieve over a loss. It was a noisy thing. There were instruments, there were lutes, there were cymbals that were part of that procession. There was the wailing widow at the front of it. There was just all the commotion and this, this whole thing is happening and and, and i got to tell you that this was not the first time Jesus had ever seen this. I mean, this was kind of a routine thing. I mean, when you are driving down the road and you see the, the, the corridor of cars coming at you with their lights on, you know what's happening. You? you know somebody's passed away. It's just a routine kind of thing. It happens. People die. People lose loved ones. Just a routine kind of thing. I began to think about this in my own life. I invite you to maybe share with me these thoughts. I think about how all the lost people in the world, when I say lost, I mean all those in the world around us who just don't know Jesus. They don't have any clue what it is to have a, an alive relationship with Christ themselves. And, and I don't know about you, but I've noticed that I can go into this store and that store or, or frequent that place of business or be at that same restaurant, you know, a few times a month, month or whatever the case, or that coffee shop. And, and I can go into all those places and work by those people that I know every day in all those kinds of situations. I can be there and I can, their lostness can become routine to me and I just don't even know this. I'm just used to them being lost. You know, the people that you work with, you're just used to them being lost. That's just the way they are. The people you go to school with, that's just my friends. Yeah, yeah, they don't know Jesus. And yeah, wow, well, they, they've really got a lot, of, a lot of junk going on in their lives. But you know, that's just the way they are. But what if what if we came into the scene? What if we walked around in the power of the Spirit, which Jesus gives us as believers, and what if we just, like Jesus, were the people that we could bring Jesus into that scene in their lives? What if you could just bring Jesus into the scene of people's lives in your neighborhood, the person that lives right next to you, or across the street, or the person you work with, whatever that that relationship is, what if you just brought Jesus into that situation in a fresh new way? How does that happen? How do we bring how do we bring Jesus into that? Because here's what happens. When Jesus comes into the picture, guess what happens? Life happens. That's what happens. When, when Jesus came into your heart and life, guess what happened? Life happened. We were dead in our trespasses and sins, but God made us alive in Christ. And so wherever you go, wherever, whenever we really live the life and walk as Jesus walked, wherever we go, there ought to be something about life coming into that situation just because of how we live. So I was thinking about these examples about ways that life comes. Here's some ways that life comes. When we obey the leading of the Spirit in our lives, life comes. Dads, when you just when you just step out and you live in obedience to God, 
and you you lead your family in the way that you understand God has called you to lead your family, life comes to your family. But when you don't, when you lag behind, when you sort of drag your feet spiritually, when you, when you just don't pay attention spiritually, you know what happens? You know what happens? The life that could have come doesn't. It's a huge thing. When any of us obey, God comes. When we pray, God comes. If my people who are called by, by my name will humble themselves and pray. I mean, that whole scripture, that famous scripture in Chronicles. When people, when we pray, God comes. You know, when you pray, something happens. Life happens. When you don't pray, it doesn't. It makes a difference. I can't understand how all that works, but all I know is this. If we pray, it changes things. When we forget, God comes. Wow. You know, most of the counseling that I did as a pastor, as I sat with people in my office, I would guess that 90% of the time, when we finally got down to what was the real root issue that we were dealing with, most of the time, we had to deal with unforgiveness. We had to talk about, okay, what are you going to do? Are you going to forgive that person or not? And how are you going to do that? How are you going to live in forgiveness? Husbands and wives, man, when there's a climate of forgiveness in your marriage relationship, it changes your home. God comes. Life comes to your marriage. Life comes to you. You're refurbished. In any relationship, when we forgive, God comes. You know why? Because you can't forgive and live in forgiveness without the help of the Holy Spirit. When we, when we serve, God comes. When we humble ourselves before God, He comes. God opposes the crowd and draws near to the humble for ourselves. When we just get to the place where we say, okay, God, I've been over my head. This is bigger than I am. God comes. You know what I'm excited about? I'm excited about the fact that God himself loves to come and to give life. So our prayer, I think, I would just encourage our prayer to be come, Lord, Lord, through me, and, and as I go through my days, and I go into the workplace, and I go to school, wherever I'm going, just through my life, would you just intercept the procession of loss and of, dead, of death and of difficulty and of sin and of heartache and of all that sort of stuff? Would you, through my life, bring life to the places where there's no life? What does God do that? Did you know God does that? Three. So my real question to us, it says, walk as Jesus walked. I don't know about you, but when I think about walking, I think about taking the next step. Of course, there always has to, there has to come a time in your life when you take the first step. I mean, our family, my wife and I, we are just sort of waiting to see the first pictures or see the first video of my little granddaughter Zoe to take her first step. Sometimes that's going to happen. It's going to be fun. Right now she's just kind of happy to roll and crawl. Sometimes they'll take the first step. But when you have taken that first step and you've begun your life with Christ, there's still that question of, well, what's the next step? I remember just... Uh, reading about, uh, uh, recently I completed, put together my father's memoirs, and he was, had been writing about a part of his life, and told about how he became a Christian when he was 23, and, um, and then about almost 10 years later, about 8 years later, he was just in prayer, he, he, he was a dairy farmer at the time, and he, he, uh, he had a 
he had his study, he called it, in, in the barn. It was uh, kind of a desk and surrounded by bales of hay. But that's where he would go, and he would do two things there. He would, he would open his Bible and just study God's Word and memorize God's Word, and he would pray. And, uh, and one day while he was praying and kneeling there on a bale of hay, God just reminded him of some things that he needed to do that he needed to make right. There's a word for that. It's called restitution. Does anybody know that word? Restitution? It's not a bad thing to know and be sensitive and willing to make restitution for things you've done wrong. And this was a... this The Holy Spirit reminded him of something that happened when he was like 14 years old. When he was 14 years old, he and a friend of his had, uh, had gotten together and they had... Uh, they had gotten out early one morning and, and there was a man in their, their, their town who had a business and he delivered jelly rolls. And he was the jelly roll man. I'm sure other kinds of things too, but jelly rolls is what my dad remembers. And so he and his friend early one morning before the fellow took off on his route, they broke into the truck and they took the jelly rolls and then they just trashed the truck. And he went on, and it was in the newspaper, the local newspaper, and his mom and dad commented about it, and he just kind of kept his mouth shut and so on, and he had this kind of weighing on him. But after a while, it didn't weigh on him so much. He went through life, joined the Navy, and went all the different places he was going to go. And then he became a Christian, and then eight years later, God just speaks to him about this. He says, I don't know why. So he went back to his hometown. And the fellow... Was the jelly roll man was still living. And he found him. And he goes to the door and he tells him the story. And he asks his forgiveness. <coughs> there wasn't really anything particularly dramatic that came out of that story that we know of. The man said, I really appreciate knowing. I've always wondered. Who would have done this? My dad had a chance just to say why he was there. That he, that his life had changed, that he had been Jesus, that there was a reason that, and that God had just laid this on his heart that he needed to make it right. That was his next step. If you're going to walk around like Jesus walks around, it comes down to taking the next step God is asking you. So I really just have one question for us this morning. What's the next step? I think in all of our lives, we, there's a good chance we already know. You know, you might be here this morning, and, and your life at school, and your life at home, and your life at church are three different lives. And God is saying, you know, the next step I want you to take is I want you to be the same person at all these places, and I want you to live a life that honors me. I don't want you to be one way to school, one way at home some of the way to church. I just want you to be my person wherever you are. Or you might be here this morning and the next step that God is saying for you to take is you need to ask the forgiveness of someone. Or you need to give forgiveness. Or instead of uh, talking the way you've talked about that, that co-worker, you need to come into that place and you need to you need to really Love that person no matter how difficult they are. And you need to be a person bringing life. What's your next step? Would you please stand? Would you bow your heads for a moment? I'm going to pray for us. I'm going to pray for us. I'm not going to just pray for you. I'm going to, we're all in this together. And as I, as I lead us in this closing prayer, I challenge you to in your own hearts say, Lord Jesus, whatever is the next step, whatever you show me, that's what I'll do. And here's the good news. Here's what happens. You take the next step. The people around you 
realize that God is coming. And when God comes, life comes. Lord Jesus, we come before you this morning as people who claim to belong to you. And now you've told us in your word that therefore we, we must walk around like you walk around. We must conduct our lives like you. That's way beyond us apart from the help of your Holy Spirit. And yet, it's what you've called us to. And so right now, I pray for every person here. And Lord Jesus said, we thank you that you are so faithful and you have revealed to each one of us the next step. And it might be very simple or it might be very tough. Lord, we determine in our hearts right now that we will take that next step by the power of the Holy Spirit so that you might bring life in all the places where we go. And now, Lord Jesus, we pray this together in the precious and holy name of Jesus and all the people said. Amen. 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 God bless you. Thank you for being here today. Let's go and enjoy the Lord and walk with Him.